Hey, Coach Kirsten from Invictus San Diego coming at you with another episode of Coach's Corner. This time we're sitting down with Coach Kim. Kim has fulfilled every role at Invictus that you can imagine. She's been with the team for 11 years. She started as a member, was an intern, worked through the front desk, became a coach, head coach. She is now manager for the past, gosh, like five, five years, years um, at one of our San Diego locations. She's now the manager at our downtown primary San Diego location. Uh, she's also one of our nutrition coaches. So if you take advantage of Invictus Nutrition, you probably work with Kim. And we are gonna sit down and talk about a really juicy topic today. <laughs> so welcome Coach Kim. Thank you. Today, we're gonna kind of stay focused in on client states they have a body composition goal. They are pretty consistent. Maybe they've been coming to the gym for a while, over a year. As a coach, you see them in three, four, five times a week. Mm -hmm. But they are stating, and you're seeing, that they're not making a lot of progress towards that stated body composition goal. Sometimes this happens. Just going to the gym and showing up, going through the motions, is not a cure-all for getting you to your goal. So Kim, what are some things that you evaluate and talk about with your client and that you can help our coaches listening kind of some takeaway tools what do you use when you're sitting down in that situation with a client that isn't making progress towards their body composition goal yeah um i think the biggest frustration that our clients feel is that if they're putting the time and effort into coming into the gym they're taking time out of their day to be here for an hour hour and a half sometimes two hours um, they want to look the part so uh, if that's not happening, then uh, they often come with, oh, I don't understand. Um, I, you know, I have to be burning like 800 to 1,000 calories here. What, like, what is the issue? Um, and I think that that's normally where I start is, um, you know, you coming into the gym, how much time do you spend at the gym? Um, during a typical hour long workout, people burn anywhere from 200 to 400 calories. That is depending on how much effort they're putting into it. Uh, if it's a strength training workout, granted there's some carryover of those calories later on in the day, but during the actual hour that they're in the gym, they're burning 200 calories or sometimes less. Um, and that's essentially a cookie. So you- <laughs> My Snickers bars, <laughs> yes. I think more calories than that, bummer. Right, so, um, so just uh, setting some realistic expectations about what coming into the gym will actually do. Uh, in the nutrition program, we always talk about the four, pil four pillars of health and movement is one of those pillars. Um, and included in movement is coming into the gym. So uh, we wanna make sure that clients are strength training because most coaches will know that uh, muscle burns, burns more calories throughout the day than fat. So you wanna make sure that your clients are building muscle, but movement, that pillar, will also include what happens outside of the gym, so in the other 23 hours during the day. So do your clients sit when they work? Um, if people sit for eight hours a day, you norm normally burn um, about 60 calories an hour. If you stand for eight hours a day, you can burn up to 100 calories an hour. So just that small difference can be the difference between you know 200 or 300 calories, and that it could be the difference that they're not seeing, even though they're coming into the gym and they're being consistent. So. Um, talking about uh, expectations on when they are in the gym, what that's actually doing, and then talking about the other 23 hours is, uh, is kind of where I like to focus or guide that conversation after yeah. that. So you mentioned the four pillars, and just for anybody that's not familiar with them, can you lay them out? Uh, you might have already said it. What, what are the four pillars again? Um, so movement, uh, nutrition or food, uh, sleep, and stress. So okay. all four of those kind of need to be in order, in, in order for you to have any sort of body composition changes. Uh, you, without all four of them in order, um, it's harder to reach. So let's zone in maybe first on that first pillar of, okay, hey, the person is coming into the gym, so they think they're checking the box of, hey, I've got that pillar nailed, I'm doing movement. Mm -hmm. But are there any um, like misconceptions there that you look for to evaluate as a coach when somebody is like, hey, I'm coming into the gym, I'm, I'm doing the movement pillar, yeah. that you can help refine? 
Yeah, so uh, normally we would talk about non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which I don't actually normally tell clients that name, but basically what are you doing outside of the gym? So uh, I get an idea of what, how they're spending their time at work, how they spend their time with their family. Um, are they doing any super low stress type of movement during the day? Do they go for walks? Do they walk their dog? Um, do they take their kids to the park that's down the street? That kind of thing. Um, and figure out if there's any calories being burned outside of the hour at the gym. Um, and if there are those things going on, which again, most clients will kind of overestimate their amount of movement that they have outside of the gym. But if there's any of those things going on, then we might talk about um, how they can add to that. Uh, so adding in a 20 minute walk or, you know, if you're going to listen to a podcast, can you, um, can you walk down the street or can you walk to a friend's house or something like play that? Play with your kids. Play with your kids. Rather exactly. Rather than just taking the kids to the park, engage with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what about for somebody, I'm sure you have the flip side of that coin where somebody shows up and they're like, nah, like this is the only hour of movement I get. They're telling you that they mm -hmm. are a, maybe they're a workaholic. They're really dedicated to their job. It's really long, stressful hours. Mm -hmm. um, are there areas of opportunity for them to add in a little bit more movement? Or does that person really just need to buckle down and choose very specific type of activities and types of training to do in the gym? If they're in the gym, Normally, those people are, if they also have a very high stress job, now we've got two pillars a little bit out of whack. Um, and so if they come in and they're doing a CrossFit style workout that's high intensity, normally I'll try and dial it down a little bit. Um, the fat burning process only really takes place when you're going less than 60% of what your VO2 max is. So a VO2 max workout is an all out sprint, all out effort. Um, so if you can think of a percentage of that, 60% is not a ton. That's like a, a very casual bike ride or maybe a 230 row concept too. So, um, so slowing down those clients when they come in and just having them move so that they feel refreshed. They've obviously burned some calories, but they feel refreshed when they leave here is going to be way more beneficial than if they hop into a high intensity workout where they're doing some barbell cycling, burpees, and the goal is uh, as many rounds as they can for time. Yeah. That's almost like a case where trying to like really knock it out of the park in one pillar is actually possibly creating a trickle down negative effect for sure in another pillar, right? You like stress is like uh, such a intimately perceived concept, but also really like, I don't know, like out there for people because they can't, they can't always tangibly feel the effects of it, like actually slowing down their metabolism, causing inflammation in the body, totally. um, all that stuff. And, and some people don't realize how stressed they are. Oh, That's the yeah. other thing is that like, this is just their general state of being. So <laughs> it's <laughs> normalized, a not ideal state. Exactly. So now is there any specific kind of training that you, like, I feel like a lot of people come in, they've got body composition goals and they kind of want to chase that high of, Oh my God, I, I love going for that, like, but did I die feeling when I walk out of the gym? Mm -hmm. Now, if you see somebody coming in constantly chasing that, do you try to direct them more towards strength training? Yes, okay. that would be my other, uh, I was just gonna say the, uh, the ability to slow people down when this is what they want to do and what they want to attack, and especially if it's something that's written on the board, um, it's really hard to do. And there, it takes a lot of trust and a lot of buy-in um, from the client before there's any results that are seen mm -hmm. um, for that to actually work. And so it takes, it takes a lot more effort on the coach and the client part to not fall into the, look what everybody else is doing um, camp. So the other option is to direct them towards more strength training and um, they can still get a very good like uh, high that you would get from working out but um, more so trying to promote muscle protein synthesis so building muscle building muscle mass um, and i would not have them go for a one rep max all the time i would have them do more hypertrophy work so sets of eight to ten back squats um, would be much more effective to building muscle mass for those clients than a, trying to hit their one rep max or even putting them on a cycle to hit their one rep max. So um, 
that's the other thing to do is put them on more hypertrophy training yeah. and they can still get the kind of workout high. They still feel strong when they leave the gym. They're still getting a bit sweaty. If you've ever done a set of eight to 10 at a fairly heavy weight, you're still going to cardiovascularly challenge eight yourself. Eight to 10 is cardio. Yes. That's exhausting. <laughs> That's why people pick one and two rep maxes. They're like, done. Exactly. Just done. <laughs> exactly. It's a journey to get to like a 10 to 12 rep. Mm -hmm. Um, you've mentioned, uh, so real quick for like folks that aren't familiar with Invictus programming, when we run our quote unquote, like CrossFit style class, it's called performance and fitness. Mm -hmm. That class has two tracks. One is performance. One is fitness. Um, they mirror each other in the movement patterns that go on that day. So everybody can be warmed up the same way, right? If there's a squat pattern, there's a squat pattern. Um, but the difference is, is that our performance track tends to be a little bit more uh, possibly higher skilled, a little bit more technical, but often pursuing absolute strength while our fitness track, while may appear less technical, let's never confuse less technical for easier or simpler for easy. Um, it has, um, more of a whole body, uh, like reach during its program. Like you'll often see an upper lower split. You'll see rep ranges mm -hmm. and more sets that are in line with building muscle, these, you know, three to four working sets, eight to 12 plus reps. Um, so that would be where you might direct and maybe you have to educate your clients. And this is kind of what I'm getting to of definitely, how do you have that conversation with your client when you say, Hey, you actually need to start shifting from choosing performance track to fitness track. How can you, how do you get them to realize that one track is more in line with achieving their goal than another. The main difference between absolute strength and uh, the hypertrophy training is one, you are actually building muscle mass. So you are increasing the amount of fibers that you have. Um, the other one is you're making those fibers stronger. So absolute mm -hmm. strength means that you can only work with the muscle mass that you currently have. Um, if you are trying to build that muscle mass, it doesn't mean you can never train your absolute strength, but let's work on making your muscle mass big so that when you do train absolute strength, you've got a bigger mass to work with. Yes. Um, and so that's normally the explanation that I will give to clients who are feeling frustrated because they feel really strong and they, you know, may be able to lift a ton of weight, but it's just not showing. Yes. So then you're like, well, okay, so let's, let's build more muscle. Let's, let's take you off of your one rep maxes and let's, create more muscle fibers that you can then revisit later and make even stronger. Um, without the ability to add on to the pyramid, you're just working with your little triangle. That is, if you get nothing else out of this, <laughs> this coach's corner, just take that clip, give to all of your clients, make sure that they understand that concept. It, um, layering in understanding and education to your clients, if that's important to them, um, that is one way to get them to realize, like making sure that their actions are in line with the goal that they want to pursue. Some, sure. you might have a client that they're like, oh, coach told me to just do fitness track more often. All right. They told me I'd reach my goal. That's a nice to have, but sometimes, but we get, not often. Yeah. Right. We get the mind. Sure. So if you need the why, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Are there any other kind of like initial low hanging fruits? in some of the other like lifestyle, sleep, um, stress areas that you like, or even nutrition areas that mm -hmm. you like to kind of quickly identify and cover with clients that aren't making progress towards their body composition goals. So everyone knows that nutrition is part of the fitness world. And if you, if you want to have the body composition of you know, an elite athlete, nutrition has to play some part of that. So, um, there are low hanging fruits that are not glamorous in any way. Um, but that need to be the absolute foundation of anyone who's looking to, um, to really have any body composition and that's getting bigger or getting smaller. Um, so water intake is one of them. Uh, Americans in general, I'm not a hundred percent sure about the rest of the world, but Americans in general are terrible at taking in enough water. Um, and the general rule is half your body weight in ounces. Um, so if you have a 120 pound athlete, you're gonna require that they are they consume 60 ounces of water. Um, that's a half gallon of water. That's a lot of water. And most people think that they get enough water throughout the day, but if you actually have them track it, um, 
especially if they don't start drinking water until about noon, there's no way that they're getting it enough. I feel seen. So, okay. <laughs> good. Um, I'm talking directly to you. Wait, so uh, <laughs> really quick, why is, because uh, I actually feel like a lot of folks hear that, they're like, yeah, yeah, coach, I know, I'm supposed to drink water. Totally. But if they don't know why it will impact them, um, they might not do it. They might not actually buy into yeah. that very simple thing. And then they start reaching for the like, 1% things that, you know, like, hey, but like, what's the protein powder I should use? Yes. How much, you know, collagen and creatine should I take and glucosamine? So why is the water so important? Yeah, uh, so water is going to make it so that your muscles glide. They, uh, it works with the fascia of your body so that if you are strength training, you can actually get the maximum contractions out of your muscles that, that you should be getting. Um, if your muscles are sticking, it's like trying to, you know, like open a door that isn't moving. You're just, you're pushing and pulling on things that are not, um, are not smoothly moving like they should be. Okay. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is, um, contrary to popular belief, if you don't drink enough water, your, the scale can actually show as Increase. higher. Yes. Um, so drinking enough water allows your body to because of water retention. Yeah, essentially, um, get rid of water that it doesn't need. In a panic mode where you're not getting in enough water, it's going to retain what it can so that it can use it for a future time. Um, Great. Not as extreme as like a camel, but I mean, you're, you're going to see no a one to camel. two. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah. Um, but that, that in general, it also helps with digestion. I mean, there's a ton of other things, gut health, um, brain fog, all of that stuff can be helped by water. And that's just just that's just H2O. Yeah. Like, okay. That's not like uh, sparkling water. You don't have to add in electrolytes. You don't have to add in anything like that. Just drink some water throughout the day. Um, and you should immediately feel like you have more energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that one's one low hanging fruit. The second low hanging fruit, and again, super basic, and everyone probably knows they should be doing it, but eating enough vegetables during the day. Uh, the more fiber you can get into your body, the more calories your body burns as it breaks down food. So the highest fiber foods are vegetables, and so it's gonna burn more calories in general just eating those. Um, if you're eating processed foods or bars or things like that, you may be getting in your like, macros, but your body doesn't need to work as hard to break those things down. So um, I like to use like peanuts versus peanut butter as a good example. Both of them are considered fairly healthy as far as, you know, compared to like a Snickers bar. But if you're gonna eat peanuts, there's more fiber involved in there. It's gonna cost your body more calories to break down those peanuts into little parts that it can actually use. Peanut butter is literally just gonna slide through it. Okay. So, um, so that's a good example of just kind of the after effects of what you eat, burning more calories, so that can help. Um, but vegetables in general have micronutrients that you need in order to fuel all sorts of different parts of your body. And in general, all I tell people is make sure that you get two hands full of vegetables a, uh, at, honestly, I'll start with a day. Um, so if you spread out your hands and you can do this on your plate and you've got that many vegetables, you are better than probably 50% of the American public. Um, because if you are a person who doesn't pay attention to that, you will notice that vegetables are almost the last thing that you grab on a daily basis. Um, so that's going to be... So that's the base. That's like super base. A base. day. Mm -hmm. What is the optimal, like where you want to get your clients? Yeah. Optimal would be if they're weighing and measuring somewhere between 600 and 800 grams of uh, vegetables a day. Other than that, it would be um, as much color as you can. So uh, adding in purples and yellows and reds and things like that are going to have different micronutrient patterns. Um, and then I would have, if you're eating three big meals a day, now your handfuls should be at each meal. Okay, great. That kind of brings us to an opportunity that if we wanna go down this rabbit hole, we can, or we can go back to it. Um, when you begin talking about some of these low hanging fruits, pun intended, fruits and veggies, low hanging, grab them, <laughs> uh, with clients, if they have not already like approached you and been like, I want to track macros because tracking macros is not necessary for making body composition changes, right. nor is it actually the best way to keep some clients on track. Do you default often to putting them on tracking macros or do you try to be like, just go case by case, client by client, 
when somebody says I'm not going to track or you've identified them as a client that look, they're not going to track their macros. <laughs> right. How can I help them still be successful? Yeah. Are these just like, what are some of the ways that you help them still be aware of what they're eating without tracking? Yeah. Uh, so that's a great question. A lot of people, because macros are everywhere on the internet and things like that, a lot of people will come over and say like, can you, can you give me your mac give me my macros? Um, and my assignment to them is track the food that you're currently eating for four days. That way you will know if they can even start to track. Um, because having people track what they're currently eating is one of the most frustrating things that people, people do. And it's because they don't have a new assignment. They're just supposed to be weighing and measuring everything that they currently do. Um, so one, it brings awareness to what they're currently taking in, but two, they're like, well, I don't know where I should be, so this is super frustrating. Um, you also can't tell them where they should be unless you know where they're starting from. Yes. So, uh, so if a client can track what they're currently eating for four days, um, then I may go into like appropriate macros for them and what kind of where things should be. Um, I also, most of the time, only start with people if they track for four days, just giving them a protein assignment. Um, Great. So most people are deficient in protein, um, just in general. And so making sure that they're getting enough protein will often um, basically balance out the rest of it. Um, and so there's that. If somebody doesn't do that first assignment or comes back after the first day and they're like, I don't even know what app to use or what, like, mm. what is a gram of protein or something like that, then there's much simpler ways of getting them to recognize what they're eating. And that's just like the hand measurement scale. Um, and so there's like protein, there should be a fist to maybe a fist and a half of protein on every plate. There should be the two hands worth of veggies. And then there should be just the top part of your thumb worth of fat. Um, and that's on a daily, kind of on your daily basis. Lots of people will then come back and be like, well, I make a lot of food and I, you know, do like soups and I put everything in the like blender, whatever. That's fine. Measure it before you put it in. Um, and it's just, all that does is bring an awareness around what people are doing. Or they're like, I can't measure a cookie with that measuring thing then you're like well then then that's not an option to eat right now yeah. um because if it doesn't fit into one of those categories then it's probably not the best thing for you so um so that's that's kind of where you start there's also other clients that just don't even have the base knowledge of what is a protein what is a carb what is a fat yes um so that is more of a okay come in let's sit and talk for an hour about what what you currently eat and where all of those foods would fit into uh, like the grand scheme of things. Yeah, helping them identify some easy, easy swaps, um, options, alternatives. Yeah. Okay, so so far I've heard when we're evaluating some low hanging, um, low hanging fruit, love that pun, on our nutrition pillar, where you're first making sure that folks are uh, choosing to eat whole food, whole real food, as close to its original you know, source found in nature as possible rather right. than further along the chain of being processed, increase their water, mm -hmm. make sure they're eating enough vegetables and increase their protein. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. Those would be my, those are your go-tos. And honestly, if people can do that part of it, yes, there are little things that they can do that will help performance wise or um, will help in other ways. But those, you're not hitting those things. No, yeah. I, I don't hit those things with 98% of the clients because it's the huge gross errors that are um, the changes that people actually need. Yeah, um, they're sucking the energy out. And sometimes totally. the clients are focusing on all these little things and you're like, hey, I know you had that cookie, no big deal, but did you eat any vegetables today? Totally. Like, if not, that's actually probably our bigger problem. Eat the cookie, but do so after you have, yes. you know, whole food with your glass of water high in protein and with some veggies on your plate. Exactly. The cooking ain't the problem. It's the fact that we're not hitting anything all else the other there. major yes. components. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I think we dug into a lot. <laughs> I feel like we could keep digging. Absolutely. I think there's going to be a part two. Great. All right. Thanks, okay. Kimmy. Absolutely. Thank you.